Hello and welcome to the Apologetics 315 podcast with your hosts, Brian Auten and Chad Gross. Join us for conversations and interviews on the topics of apologetics, evangelism, and the Christian worldview. At ease, officer. I'm Peter Venkman. I think there's just been a slight misunderstanding, and I want to cooperate in any way that I can. Hello, this is Brian Auten. I'm joined with Chad Gross. Chad, have you ever uh, phoned somebody, and when they pick up the phone, they're laughing with a conversation that they're finishing up as they pick up the phone to talk to you? Yeah, I have had that happen. Why do you ask? It is just so weird. It's so weird yeah. when that happens. I always assume it's because on the caller ID, they see it's me and they're like, <laughs> oh, gosh, it's Chad, that idiot. You know, I always wonder. I always assume it's that. You mean yeah. it's something else? Maybe it's not that that happens to other people. Oh, that's so comforting. The other thing that's really annoying is that sometimes at my work, places will call me. And as I pick up the phone and I'm like, hello, this is such and such business. They say I'm hearing them laughing and like finishing their conversation. And then I'm like waiting for them to start talking. Like I've answered the phone and now I'm waiting them for them to finish their conversation so that like I can see what they want. OK, I'm about ready to hang up right now. You know, you should just join in the laughter. You should just join in. <laughs> yeah. You know, as they're yeah, laughing, yeah. you should just be, you should be oh, 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 that, that's a good one, yeah, Frank. Yes, yeah, you know? yes, yes, indeed. And then when they're like, what? I don't know. That's just an idea. Yeah. So. Well, anyway, that's for the listener to uh, just think about. If you've had that experience where you call people and they're laughing and then answering the phone, I want to hear about it. I want to hear your story. Send it to us and we'll read it. Um, doesn't even have to be apologetics we, related. <laughs> we we want to be with you through that trauma. We will help. We, we want to help you. We want to suffer through it with you. We will do that. Well, today we've got a great interview lined up, and that's what you're here for. Not this crazy banter. We're interviewing Jay Warner Wallace, no stranger to the podcast, and anyone familiar with the apologetics world is familiar with Jay Warner Wallace or Jim Wallace. In my opinion, he's probably like one of the most prolific. Christian apologists I know. I mean, he's creating podcasts and videos and articles. He's authoring a pile of books. They're all super interesting and helpful, all for exploring the evidence for Christianity. I think he's made a huge impact and he's continuing to do so. Straight from his bio, if you've never heard about him before, he's a Dateline featured cold case homicide detective. He is a popular national speaker, best selling author, and he continues to consult on cold case investigations while serving as a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. He's also an adjunct professor of apologetics at Talbot School of Theology, that's over with Biola, and Southern Evangelical Seminary. And he's a faculty member at Summit Ministries. But wait, there's more. Jay Warner became a Christian at the age of 35, and that was after investigating the claims in the New Testament Gospels. And he was using his skill set as a detective. So he, he uh, part of the interview today, we'll be talking about a little bit about that journey of him becoming of a Christian, because the methods he used to sort of figure out, hey, you know, is this New Testament stuff? Is this Jesus guy real? Well, he used some of his detective skills to figure that out for himself. So we're going to be talking to Jim about his most recent book. You've probably heard about it. It's called Person of Interest. Why Jesus Still Matters in a World that Rejects the Bible. And you can find out more at personofinterestbook.com. Chad, we've already talked a little bit about this, giving our initial impressions, but I'm excited to have Jay Warner with us today. Yeah, I am as well. I don't know about you, but when I meet somebody who might have a, a teenager who is struggling with their faith or when I meet someone who's interested in looking into the evidence for Christianity, but they really don't have a great background in the uh, disciplines that apologetics includes, Jay Warner's probably the go-to guy for me because I think he presents things so concisely, so clearly. And as we talked about in a prior podcast, he tells the story of investigating Jesus alongside investigating an actual cold case. Yeah, that he's investigated in the past. And so the books end up reading somewhat like a really interesting crime novel mm -hmm. while you're looking at this evidence. And so it's super engaging, very clear, up to date as far as scholarship goes and, and where the debates are, whether it be the existence of God or the reliability of the Gospels or uh, the deity of Christ. And uh, so, yeah, he's kind of my go to guy. Uh, I would say it was it was Lee Strobel. And I think his work is still super valuable. 
But I think the topics that Jim has picked for his books, it's, it's just nice because he kind of has the reliability of the Gospels with Cold Case. He's got God's crime scene, which is the existence of God. He's got forensic faith, which is kind of, okay, now that we know God exists and the Gospels are reliable, what do we do with that now as Christians? And then, of course, this latest book, The uh, Person of Interest, which demonstrates why Jesus still matters in a world that rejects the Bible, or maybe we would say is skeptical of the Bible. Yeah. So I find his work tremendously helpful. He's had uh, podcasts that he's created for a long time. I remember benefiting from those a lot. It went back when he was doing Please Convince Me uh, podcasts. Yes. Really, really helpful. And he, he is very pastoral. He, he has been a, a youth pastor in the past and has a very pastoral, caring sort of approach, but so uh, practical, so down to earth, like you know, if you've heard the phrase, a $1 apologist, that's what some a term he has coined. Mm -hmm. And it's it's the idea that, you know, we don't need these big, you know, a uh, bunch of million dollar apologists, uh, one or two million dollar apologists like, oh, this would be the spokesperson for Christianity. What we need is, you know, million one dollar apologists, people who can go out there and make a, a case for, uh, be Christian case makers, even the languages that he chooses to use in describing being a Christian, a Christ follower. He would use um, other things that he would do would be using illustrations that are very simple, breaking things down from academic level down to practical, useful level. So very approachable. And as far as I'm saying all that, because you said he's like a go-to person to refer to others. He's got such good credibility mm -hmm. from, you know, exploring evidence and, and coming from, not, well, he right. wasn't raised in a Christian home and a Christian all his life sort of a thing. Not that, that that's great, but coming as an atheist and only becoming a Christian at 35, you know, he can speak to the atheist and say, Hey, I've been there and uh, I've looked at the evidence and he knows what evidence is. He knows how to evaluate it. And so there's that credibility aspect that I really appreciate. And so referring his resources to other people is a no brainer. So I'm excited about this one. The great thing about Jim's books, uh, and I know I'm quite confident you'll agree with this, is not only are you learning to, you're learning arguments for the reliability of the Gospels, the existence of God and those things. He's actually teaching you how to think so that you can take these skills and apply them to any investigation that you personally might want to look into. So for yeah. example, if you wanted to if you wanted to look into uh what is the best view of eschatology, you know, you could take some of the skills that he teaches and apply those to that investigation. And so not only are you learning great arguments, you're also learning how to think. And then the other thing is I was remembering Brian uh, earlier today, I rem I recalled that he actually wrote an essay in one of your essay series. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He w and that was kind of before he had really taken off. You know, that's when he was still doing Please Convince Me and he was still kind of climbing. I don't know if you want to say the ranks or however you want to put it. But uh, he he did an essay. I remember that uh, for the essay series on Apologetics 315. If you want to check out those essay series, go start digging around Apologetics 315. Lots of other great resources as well. Yes. Right. Well, let's go to the interview. Let's get ready. Switch me on. Jay Warner Wallace, thanks for joining us for the podcast. Oh, you know, I'm a big fan of you guys. So I'm I'm very, very happy to, to be on your podcast. I'm so glad you guys are I've kind of re-energized and now you have the podcast running and I've been listening and it's been good. So I really appreciate you having me on. Well, thank, thank you. you. Well, we're here to talk about your awesome new book, Person of Interest, Why Jesus Still Matters in a World That Rejects the Bible. And we've kind of uh, in the podcast uh, talked a bit about our first impressions and, you know, thoughts we're having on it. But we're excited to talk to you about it today. I want to ask first off about homicide cases. The thing that I found really interesting is this idea of a nobody missing homicide case. And uh, can you explain what that is and how that relates to exploring the historical Jesus? Well, you know, part of what we do in some of these cases is we're looking for the things that the first set of detectives missed. And sadly, we do have a collection of missing persons, and our, our sergeants will go through these over the years, you know, just, just kind of catch up, see. I mean, really, if you do this well, you're going to check your missing persons cases every year. 
uh, you're going to have a date, probably on the first anniversary, just to make sure that thing was closed. Make sure, hey, they came back and maybe they came back two weeks later and whatever reason, the paperwork wasn't fi- uh, filed on it. So it's, it looks like it's open on the computer. But in reality, they've been they've been home for, you know, 11 months. So that's what you and that's 95 percent of the time what you find. But occasionally something for whatever reason slips through the cracks. And I have actually had cases where a, a guy kills his wife and uh, reports are missing. And is so persuasive and so beloved by the victim's family that they never question it. They they think, well, you know, maybe she would. And uh, she had in the past, they have fought. And he's just convinced them that, um, and sometimes they'll do little subtle things. I didn't talk about in the book, but sometimes they'll do little subtle things like like call uh, from a pay phone or back in those days or or now modern times, just call from an unlisted number or call from a, a throwaway phone. As if, uh, and then not, not say anything, just call. And then when the kids pick up the phone and they say, hello, hello, and you don't say anything. And they think, was that, was that my mom? Does that my mom calling? Maybe, maybe you do this on every anniversary or every birthday or something significant that they would associate with her. So you can find ways to kind of keep the case feeling like a missing persons when in fact mm-hmm. it's a homicide. And then by the time you start working it as a homicide, now you're like, okay, enough's enough. She never showed up anywhere. Um, aside from these hang up calls or the calls where no one says anything, there, there's no other evidence she's alive, no use of any credit cards, no use of her social security number. She never talks to her kids. Her kids are young when she leaves. Come on. What mom does this, especially if she's the kind of person who's just the opposite of that by everyone's description. But um, then what do you do? Because you, now you, you haven't worked it as a murder. And some, I've got a case where I, we didn't know one worked it as a murder for like six years. And by that time, you know, he's moved from the house and they've redesigned the house. The new owners remodeled everything. There was never any photographs of the crime scene. There's never any evidence collected. It was never considered a murder. Wow. So now you have a nobody murder case. You know, we had one recently here in, in America. It got a lot of attention, both positive, negative, all that, you know, from a woman who was missing. And then they find her body, uh, you know, weeks later. Um, but sometimes you don't find a body. And then the question is, how do you solve this when you don't? It appears to be an empty crime scene. Well, um, that approach, we typically will tell a jury, and, and if you think about it, we're always investigating murders as part of a timeline, right? Like no murder occurs just out of the blue. It, there's something that builds up towards murders, typically. Not always, but if it's a pre, if it's a premeditated kind of murder, like a first-degree murder, it, usually there's something that's occurring over time that it gives a trigger, several triggers that then end up uh, escalating. In other words, that bomb that goes off on the day of the murder is preceded by a fuse of intensity that increases as it gets closer to the actual detonation. And then once it explodes, there's all this shrapnel and debris all over the crime scene. And so all over the blast radius. So what we do in those kinds of cases, we just work the fuse and the fallout. We work the fuse and the fallout to show everybody that there's a felony that occurred on the day she went missing. So the approach I'm taking in this book, Person of Interest, is just really to say, okay, you know, I had such skepticism about scripture that, I, I, you might as well have destroyed all the scripture because I wasn't about to read it. And when I finally started reading it and I bought a Bible and just to read it for the red letters, I had such distrust because of all the miracles. Like I could accept Jesus as a smart guy. And that's how he was first pitched to me. Mm-hmm. But I didn't I didn't really accept any of the stuff that I thought was the mythology woven within the, the facts. So so how do you what if you just were to take the argument that I don't trust anything in the New Testament? I refuse to read it. Well, there's a lot of stuff you could. That's like I mean, if you have this empty crime scene, you won't read, you won't look at anything in the crime scene. If you've considered the crime scene, the New Testament documents. Well, you could still make a case like a missing persons case by just looking at the fuse of history and the fallout of history to determine what it is that happened there in the first century. And that's the approach we're taking. And a lot of the reason why, um, you know, I like a creative approach. But you guys both know that. I mean, I mm-hmm. want books that are uh, taking an angle that no one else has taken. Yes. And when we teach these classes, like with Frank Turk at the Cross-Exam and Instructors Academy, we're always trying to help you know, uh, writers who are thinking about writing a book to make sure that they, they write the book that only they could write from mm. their personal experience, from their, their angle, from their own personal testimony. Everyone's got a, an approach they could – every one of us has got an approach they could take that if they were – didn't try to be somebody else. If they just try to be themselves, it'll be a unique approach because every one of us is unique. And so I'm always trying to do that. But that really wasn't so much what was driving this book project. I mean, this is really how I looked at Jesus in the very beginning. Because, you know, uh, like I said, when we started, sometimes what you're doing is you're just trying 
to find the the angle that nobody looked at because this is why it stayed unsolved. Okay, so you did like the, all the X's and O's I would expect you to do back in 1985. You you know you crossed all those T's and you dotted all those I's, but, but nothing got solved. So what do we? What can we do now? I mean, there's nothing. It's even harder sometimes. You know, 25 years later. So what do you do now? Hmm. Well, now what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, so you you kind of looked at the first row of dominoes that falls, but you know, think about it. If those dominoes did fall the way you think they did. There's probably other dominoes that have fell that maybe outside a little bit that you haven't looked at. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at all that stuff. And that's how we end up solving a bunch of cases. And that's kind of what I thought with Jesus. I thought there's got to be a, a, some stuff. If Jesus is who this pastor said he was, the smartest man who ever lived, had this huge impact. Okay, then there should be. A, if he's God, there should be like evidence. All like It shouldn't be limited to these, you know, four gospels in the New Testament. Like there should be like an impact, right? If this is an asteroid that hit the earth. There should be an impact radius. And so that's what I'm looking for in, in this book. So I question when we look at cold case, which was kind of the investigation of the reliability of the gospels. And then we look at God's crime scene, which was the does God exist kind of the mm. investigation of that. And then this book, what was the order that you did those investigations? So is it correct? Like, because I'm I'm imagining no. it's it's kind of the person of interest investigation, then the reliability of the Gospels or does that make sense? No. So, yeah. So it was messy. It wasn't. It, I wish it was linear, but it wasn't. You know, you write <laughs> books in a linear fashion because your publisher says, "What's the next thing you're going to write?" Right. And so you're like, okay, and you try to put these in a. Because you could imagine if, if if I was to try to chronicle the stuff I was doing for nine months or so in the very beginning, eight nine months, um, I think you you would just see it. So it was pretty chaotic, mm-hmm. right? Because I'm just pretty ADD to begin with, and and I and what happens is something would trigger something for me, and I would shoot off for a couple of days and study that. And then I, I, and I would say, okay, I'm done with that. Now I come back over here. And so, so, so yes, the stuff that I did in God's crime scene was stuff I was looking at all along because I'm constantly in this tug of war about the miracles in the New Testament. Gotcha. Like, how can I believe these miracles? I, if it wasn't for that, I don't know that I would have spent as much time studying the evidence for God because I really thought that the story of Jesus, if we could just take out the miracles, seemed to be like pretty benign. And he's a smart old ancient sage. There's a bunch of old Jewish sages that have smart things to say. So that's great. You know, the Baha'u law said it a lot of smart things and the Baha'i faith. I mean, okay, you could read all these things, but it was the miracle stuff that would constantly cause you to have to go back and say, well, okay, how do you deal with that? How do you wrestle with that? I mean, if you either believe all of it or none of it, can you believe part of it? Can I excise Mm. out the wisdom statements of Jesus and deny all the other stuff? It just didn't seem like it was consistent. So I, I spent a lot of time just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So it definitely was not a sequence. It wasn't like I did all the stuff in God's crime scene at that point. It just all happened. I knew that, though, that the stuff in God's crime scene was foundational. If there's no God, there's no Christian God. Yeah. So, I mean, I wish that, that in those days I'd had a book like um, like maybe like Frank Turek's I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, where he kind of builds from truth to God, to miracles, to scripture, to Jesus, right, to resurrection. Okay. I, I just didn't have any, I didn't even know there was a discipline called Christian apologetics. So as I'm looking at this stuff, I'm trying to go back to... Like, okay, if I'm talking about stuff in the first century, I got to go back to those sources that are available to me in the first century. God, I wish I had known. Well, maybe there wasn't. Maybe when I started, this was probably like 90, 90, you know, let's say 95 or six. I got to remember now. Okay. So if, if there probably were good apologetics books out there, I just didn't know that there was such a discipline. And sure. so I was looking at it from the perspective of, well, hold on a minute. If this happened in the first, so where's this happening in the first century? Okay. So let me go back and figure out it. Is there anybody else writing about this region? Is there, what's going like, it's, it was heavy lifting because, uh, but it was okay because I got a lot of this stuff in used bookstores and I didn't know where to look. So like, I'd be asking people like, do you have a history section? Like ancient, <laughs> ancient history? Like I wish I just said, walked in and said, Hey, do you have a Christian apologetics section? Well, but maybe in some ways, it's better to go back. And I always tell people this too. Uh, one of the criticisms that come up of a person of interest from some uh, of the people who are, are atheists who have read the book or at least heard about the book, I have said, you know, um, well, do you have any primary, do you have any sources of experts? Like you're not using some of the standard expertise, um, academic expertise. And I don't really rely heavily ever on academics who have looked at the evidence. I want to know though what evidence they're looking at. And then I just mm-hmm. kind of configure, you know, I think that at some point my problem, my concern is, that with a lot of the experts, 
if prosecution brings in an expert, there's a good chance he's been a career civil servant who is always testifying for the prosecution. And he just, he works Mm. probably for law enforcement or some form. Maybe he works for the Los Angeles crime lab, you know, and if, if I'm calling an expert for the defense, this is a dude who's only called as a defense witness probably, and is coming in from that perspective. So each one, I think you could, you could honestly say has got a foundational presuppositional bias that kind of, Mm -hmm. you have to at least try to figure out how do I remove that before I assess their decisions? Well, I don't want to have to do all that. So I just want to know, like, what are you basing these on? And we tell jurors all the time, you have the freedom to absolutely ignore any expert testimony. That's not evidence, that's opinion. So yeah. the evidence is the evidence, and then they're going to give you an opinion about the evidence. But remember, their opinion is not evidence. You can go ahead and reject it if you don't think, don't agree with it. Yeah. So for the most part, I'm trying to always go back to the sources. Well, and it's always it's one of those darned if you do and darned if you don't, because then if you if you present all the experts, it's like, oh, well, he's just offering arguments based on authority. I know. <laughs> and then, yeah, right. And then if you yeah. if you present arguments based on the sources, it's like, well, but he didn't consult any experts. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, like... I'm at the point where I just you, know, you just do you just do who, be who you are when you write books, be who you are. Um, take the experiences that, that God has given you. Mm-hmm. And and I, I didn't really, you know, it was I was doing the job about nine, eight, nine years before I became a Christian. And so I didn't realize that all this stuff was going to be leveraged in this way. Um, mm-hmm. but that once you have that experience then, and you know, look, I, I had a, um, I had a design degree and an architecture degree and just basically sat on it. I mean, I, I finished those degrees and I was working in architecture. I became a cop and for the next 25 years, you know, who, who would know that eventually all those things are going to pop up as illustrations in books. Yeah. You just, you know, so God uses these weird things. Now, I, I want, my encouragement to anyone who's listening to this is that, that, you know, all of us at some point need to shift from content consumers to content creators mm-hmm. and look what you've done you know when you first started your websites you know you were probably more in the content kind of consumer and but then you start to start a website and now you're like creating content you're creating mm-hmm. reviews and your own your own pieces and now you've got the podcast and you're like now you're really who knows where this is going to go but right. every one of us who's a fan of this kind of thing could eventually know enough and should eventually know enough to be able to use their life experiences and their unique perspectives. Trust me, this is happening on the other side. It's not like all the other people on YouTube who are not Christians are are somehow um, all academics with PhDs. There are people like us who have an interest yeah. in this mm-hmm. um, and who will find experts who agree with them and they'll present those experts. So look, everyone's in the same boat. I think that what we do is we we just have honest conversations about it. And, and if you discover something, let's talk about it. And that's what I try to do in this book is try to show you, hey, there's a bunch of stuff hidden in plain sight that is in, in the nooks and crannies of culture that really is hard to explain unless Jesus is who he said he was. Well, let's talk a bit about the fuse. You discussed some of the prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus, and it was so helpful, the distinction you made uh, the difference between clear evidence when it comes to prophecy and cloaked evidence. Mm. Can you talk about why is that distinction important when evaluating the prophecies that Jesus supposedly fulfilled? Yeah, I was always and and knowing sometimes and like there's folks who are are so, so um, that if you're going to defend Christianity that they're going to go first to prophecy because that they, they feel like that's just the strongest defense you can make where you've got a great evidence from uh, Old Testament prophecy that demonstrates that Jesus is who he said he was. I was never impressed with that. I mean, really, I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't want to say that now, but, but in some ways I just don't think it's the strongest first, first angle. And a lot of that comes from the experiences I had as a relatively new Christian listening to people talk about prophecy. And I try to talk about that in the book a little bit. I mean, I remember being in a church service and and this guy would, would was reciting, you know, 300 plus prophecies that have been fulfilled by Jesus. What are the odds, the statistical odds that any one human in the history of humans could fulfill all these prophecies? And of course, by the time he gets done, it's this long, long number and you're going, wow, that's pretty amazing, right? But as he was Talking about the prophecies, I'm sitting with my, this is typical me, I'm sitting with my Bible and I'm real quickly trying to write down because he didn't like have them in the bulletin. So so he would like put them on the screen, you know, or or say them and I'm writing them down as fast as I can. So I'm not catching all of them. And then I would go and, I'm, and he's kind of like rabbit trailing in his, his sermon. Then I, I would hop in my Bible and I would like research these and I'd be looking over at Susie and leaning over to Susie and whispering, hey. This doesn't seem like too legitimate to me. I mean, I mean, this prophecy he just cited, and this is just the skeptic in me, right? I, I'm like, this prophecy he cited doesn't even, do you really think the people who first read this 
thought this was talking about a coming Messiah. I mean, unless I'm missing something here, this just seems like the plain reading of this verse in the Old Testament. Now, the problem, of course, is that many of the gospel authors are going to recite these verses as proof that Jesus was the fulfilled uh, Messiah predicted in the Old Testament. Right. The same ones that I'm reading and I'm thinking, this doesn't even, I'm not even sure this is a messianic prophecy. I mean, what, what, I, I'm like confused about what qualifies, right? Because it seems to me, and then if you do some research, unfortunately back then, well, maybe it was fortunately, the internet was really, I didn't have a home computer. And so I didn't have access to the internet at home. So I had to go to work to do it. So I asked my boss, my sergeant, can I come in a couple hours early every day and just surf the internet? You know, <laughs> he's like, and, I kind of, and if I bring in a ream of paper and a printer, uh, there's, uh, there's old, it wasn't inkjet in those days, whatever it was, that big, big thing I could put in there. I said, can I bring ink? I'll pay for it. And I just want to use a printer because I don't have us at home. He's like, look, as long as you finish before the shift starts and you pay for everything and don't, don't, don't eat anything up that, you know. Don't damage anything. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. So he let me do this. So I would print out reams of paper every morning. And, but, you know, I just didn't know where to look for some of this stuff. But it seemed like even the Jewish sources, what few I could find, did not consider those messianic prophecies. I'm talking about modern Jews. Well, of course, right? They have, they have, they have, there are lots of reasons why they reject uh, Jesus as, as Messiah. But my whole point is, I, I, I realized that what he was doing is something that we do in criminal cases all the time. That 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 pastor who was talking about was a guest speaker who was talking about prophecy. He was really doing what we do in crime scenes. And here's here's what it comes down to: in a crime scene, you have two kinds of evidence. You have clear evidence. You have cloaked evidence. Now, clear evidence for me, let's say for example, back in the day before DNA became the big thing, if you had a strong fingerprint database, and there are some pretty strong fingerprint databases, if you find a fingerprint at the crime scene, you might be able to identify the suspect just from the fingerprint because if he's in the database, he'll hit. Even some portion of just a few markers on that fingerprint, he will actually hit. So, so there, that's a way to determine. It's very clear if that guy's fingerprints in the scene, he was there, and now I can actually know who he is before I knock on his door. You know who that guy is from the onset. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you found something at the crime scene, like a button or I don't know, a piece of clothing, or um, you don't even know, you can't you can't associate with the victim. But for all you know, that thing was sitting there before the fight even started. So for all you know, that's not even related to the crime. But you've got this button sitting in the crime scene. And it doesn't go to the victim's shirt. Well, if you happen to f figure out who this guy is who was, was involved in this, and you knock on his door a week from now, and you do a search warrant at his house, and you find that he's got a shirt missing a button, and the button happens to match the other buttons on the shirt, the one you found at the crime scene, well, now you've got a piece of evidence that at first was cloaked. You weren't even sure if it was evidence of a crime. But now you know it's evidence of the crime, yeah. and you can connect it to the bad guy in hindsight to verify that he is the guy you're looking for. Right. So that piece of now we would never say, well, you should never use cloaked evidence. And in fact, we would say, no, no, we, we want to use cloaked evidence. It's an important way of verifying uh, things after the fact. So what's happening in the New Testament a lot of times is it, not all the time, but a lot of times you'll see that they're using those verses that you probably would consider cloaked in the sense that uh, you would not even be sure at first. Is this even part of the crime scene? Is this was this even part of the crime? Does this point to a coming Messiah? But then once you Messiah shows up. You can uh, compare the verse to the Messiah, and just like the button fits the shirt, you're like, oh yeah, no, this is this is this is in hindsight a confirmation, and, and I think that's absolutely appropriate in every crime scene. So this is what the New Testament authors are doing in the New Testament. I'm just trying to give you an analogy, because but but I'll tell you though, I think we have to make that that distinction when we're using prophecy as an evidence, right? Because we got to be able to help people see. I just recently talked to a young man who um, is part of a ministry here in Southern California that's very well known. And now he's kind of deconstructed his faith and he's walked away from the ministry after serving there for years. And the first question he had, and he called me about this, was the question of prophecies cited by the New Testament authors that he thought were illegitimately cited. He thought that they, they weren't clear. The Jews don't accept those prophecies. The Jews don't even read those verses in the way these authors read them. And I tried to explain this distinction to him, right? So that's an important, I think we, we have to at least kind of make those distinctions for people who otherwise might say, well, you know, I'm out because I, I don't understand those distinctions. And it seems to me like you're stretching to get that prophecy to work. But here's what I do in the book. I separate those two things. And, and on each, in each, and what I also do, and I've not seen this done, I'm sure probably somebody else has done it, but maybe not in the context all in one book. 
First of all, I'm looking at timelines, right? The fuse that burns up to the appearance of the first century. And then I'm looking at the timeline of, the, of everything that occurs after the first century. So I want to see how things fall in the sequence. And I thought, you know, how many times have you ever thought about the prophecies of Jesus? Not in terms of the categories they describe. Like this describes his birth. These describe his life. These describe his childhood. These describe his crucifixion. These describe his resurrection. What if instead you put them in the order in which they occurred in history? I wonder if that would show us anything Hmm. like it would be interesting to find out what is revealed about the coming Messiah from the clear prophecies, hold out the cloak for a second and then just go down through time and see like what's been revealed. And what you'll discover is, you know, of those six investigative questions that, you know, what, when, why, where, how. And then finally, that points to a who. We all want to know who the Messiah is, who's the Messiah. But it turns out you have the best chance of discovering the who once you've answered the first five questions. The what, when, when, where, how, why. Well, it it turns out, and if you look at the history of prophecy, really those five questions kind of are answered over time. And it's not until Jesus shows up, if you look at the prophecies and the order in which they come, when you get the clearest, by the time he shows up, You've already got good answers to those five questions. Clear mm-hmm. enough. Even even Daniel's going to tell you there's a window of opportunity in which he's going to show up. So I think that you've got enough information. Look, for example, if somebody was to show up after the first generation of prophecies, and they are ancient, there's not enough information in those prophecies where you'd even be able to recognize the Messiah, regardless of who he was. You could show up. You certainly couldn't say, well, I fulfill all of the prophecies about the Messiah because they're so general, so broad at first. There's a lot of people who might, but as they go through time and they become more and more narrow and more and more focused, less, fewer and fewer people are going to be able in hindsight to be demonstrated to be the Messiah on the basis of prophecies. It's one of those uh, ways of asking the question, why does Jesus show up when he does? Well, one reason may simply be that that prophetic fuse is now burned down to the point where it's pretty obvious who he's, he's coming. And so that's why I think, uh, that's, that's why I looked at it that way and why I took that approach. Now, look, I don't know if there's anybody else who's taken that approach, and, and I'm not trying to be like creative for the sake of being creative. I'm just telling you, if we were investigating this as a murder, we would investigate that timeline, and we want yeah. to know why did this crime occur when it did, because we think that when a crime occurs, it actually can help you make the case for a particular suspect. And mm. so we are trying to lock it in and say, hey, it happened on this day, because this is the only day he was available. It was the night, a day after he fought with her like cats and dogs. It was the day before he had to leave to go to Chicago. Okay, so all of these conditions are being met in that small opportunity. So that opportunity fits the murder. It also happens to fit him. And that's what yeah. we're trying to do with this. Yeah, well, I'll say that real quick. Um, I know Brian has a follow up, but just real quick, I wanted to say that that distinction was so incredibly helpful for me. I think it takes the teeth out of a a popular objection of, oh, you're just reading those back into the life of Jesus. And now I can say, well, yeah, I am. But that's a certain type of evidence. And then secondly, you mentioned um, how you talk about when Jesus showed up when he did. Mm -hmm. And this book is now my go to when somebody says, you know, well, why did why did he show? Why didn't he come earlier? Why didn't he come later? I'm literally going to be like, you need to read Purse of Interest. Because that is the best answer I've seen. So. Well, I, I'm really appreciative of that. You know, a, a lot of this was stuff that when we investigated it years, and Susie was with me during his whole time watching me like an idiot. Uh, <laughs> I would not. I'm so hard to hard to move on these issues, but she was patient with me, and and so I I was working this stuff, and and I remember, you know, back then I didn't need to have a book's worth of knowledge. I needed to have like a good blogger's worth of knowledge. In other words, I needed to understand the topics well enough to know they were true without having to source them, right? You know, but when you write a book, you have to source everything and you have to at least kind of say, well, where where are you getting that from? Or, you know, you can't just say, well, off the top of your head, it's not like you're having a speaking uh, knowledge of something. You want to be able to have a writer's knowledge of something. Mm. And so when I was first examining this, you know, and so then I ended up sticking this stuff in nooks and crannies in my house and having to find it all again and pull it all out. But, but the reality of it is it was very messy process, but, but it does reveal some things. Like I've never written much in detail aside, I've written a little bit in forensic faith and a little bit in cold case about forensic statement analysis, but I've been asked, Hey, would you just open up your, your, complete analysis of what you did with the Gospels. And I've thought about doing that uh, with a couple of publishers who have asked me to do it. But my goodness, it's it's such a messy process now that I'd have to go back and reconstruct all my notes on it. And so, again, when you have an understanding, jurors do not have to have the same level of understanding 
about the evidence that the prosecutor does. Uh, or the, or the, um, I typically will say when I bring a case to a prosecutor, no one is going to know this case, including the prosecutor, as well as I know the case, because I've worked it for years now. I know every single connected connection. I will know the case better. So the prosecutor is going to have to come over at some point and say, well, what about, and then I'll keep on working because he has to ask me because I am, I am the one who has to know it better than anyone else. But the juror does not need to know it at that same level. He just has to know enough about it to know that it's true. Hmm. Right. He doesn't right. have to have every single moving part and puzzle piece. And this, so there's never a juror who's ever going to, in any case I've ever worked, who makes a decision about a case, who ends up at the, in the end, knowing everything that I know uh, or to the level that I know it. And so, again, that's why we say, okay, so you can read a book like this or anyone's book. And the question is, do I need to be able to defend every page in order to, to, to present this to my friends? No, actually, you don't. And because and and, it's not the kind of thing you're going to want to do in a conversation anyway. But I knew when I wrote the book, well, now I had to source it. So like you'll see there's about 50 pages or so of, of case notes in the back of the book. But that's just the stuff that we could put in easily. We put in the easy stuff in the book so we don't want it to be too thick. There's another 279 pages of case notes on the PDF file. Wow. So we knew that that wasn't going to fit in the book. And so we had to figure out, like, how do we, like, I'm not even sure I've got a document that says how many words of the entire book is. I'll find that for while we're talking. But I think it's, it's it was a crazy amount of work to just to get mm -hmm. to a point where you could have a conversation with somebody and say, yeah, this is why he came when he came. Well, I actually wanted to ask you to lay out a few of the things that uh, made when Jesus arrived so significant, so important. One of the ones was communication and travel and things like that. But uh, as you were unpacking that, what really pushed it over for you as far as sort of tipping the balance? Yeah, and a lot of it. So there's three there's three strands of this fuse that we talk about in the book. One is prophetic. So we do talk about prophecy. And I think when you see the when the prophecies occur, you'll kind of get a sense of, okay, well, yeah, now I can see that all these questions are answered in the most robust way by the time we get to the close of the, of the Old Testament canon. And now we have 400 years of silence. Well, why? Well, I'm not sure what more you're going to say unless you're going to say, hey, okay, dude, it's Jesus, <laughs> you know, which is, what the, which is what the gospel authors say. So, so, I mean, you've really said as much as you can say about this prophecy, I think, in its most robust form. But I even try to take a, a, the point of saying, hey, what if we eliminated every cloaked prophecy? What if we eliminated every single prophet except those prophets that I consider reliable? Now, when I, of course, as a Christian, you would say, well, they're all reliable. But what I mean is by a standard. So, so we would say a reliable informant is somebody who has given us workable information that actually was true. And we made a case on it. So now when we go to court with the next guy, we can say, hey, we got an, an RI. We got a reliable informant. Because he's already, we can say in that other case two years ago, he told us who would do this robbery series. And sure enough, when we arrested the guy, it was the guy he said. So he was correct about that prior case. So now he's saying this guy's doing it. Well, now you're starting to write search warrants based on the efficacy of the reliable informant. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing you could be done here with, with these prophets. We can say, okay, well, who's, who has made a, a prediction about history? Not every prophet does this. And then that prediction comes true. So he would be in a different category as far as informants go. It doesn't mean that a, a guy who's not yet qualified as a reliable informant is not reliable. It just means he hasn't been qualified yet. So, so the same thing is here. But if we were just for sake of argument to eliminate anyone who wasn't qualified by a, an accurate prediction of history, well, we still be left with a number of prophets who, and if you look at just their clear testimony, their clear prophecies about Jesus, uh, you're going to be stuck really – and, and how we do it, I don't do it by percent. I never say by percentages. I don't, I, we don't use percentages in trial. Like what percentage do I have to be at to be at, at beyond a reasonable doubt? But that's not a way we, we consider right. it because I'm not sure what percentage would even work for each person. Like, are you comfortable with 88%? You know, how do you get to 88%? <laughs> what are the fat, what's the equation look like? So we don't do that. And I'm not going to do that in this book either. But what I asked the question is, given these descriptions, clear descriptions of what the Messiah will be, let's just work backward. Starts these, you know, the earliest descriptions that he's born of a woman. Well, that that pretty much is everybody. So now that the entire planet of history of everyone who's ever lived is all standing in their place on history, on their on their continent, you haven't eliminated anybody. But then you start to add these other descriptors. And by the time you get done, you've whittled this down. How can you think it's anybody other than Jesus? And that's the kind of approach we would take with the suspect. And that's the kind of approach we're going to take in the book. But you have to read that chapter. So that's one of those that is prophecy. The other is that there's a spiritual history of people who, of the ancient people groups, who have an, uh, an idea 
about what God is probably going to be like, just given their experience of the world and their expectations, because they too, even if they aren't Christians, were designed in the image of God by the same God who created all of us who do believe. So, so, so they have the same kinds of expectations we would have. And there's lots of tests. I actually have included some research in the book of, of surveys and studies that have been done by non-Christians in academia that demonstrate that, for the most part, our default position as humans is not a position of agnosticism or of atheism. Our default position is a view of the world that includes a higher being that's in charge and that has created things. That's just the default position of children. And a lot of research has been done on that. And this is true in ancient times as well. So when people imagine what they think God will be like, isn't it interesting that they make some approximations? And Paul noticed this, for example, on Mars Hill. And these approximations are pretty loose and not always very accurate. And then Jesus comes and he meets every single expectation of the ancients. Minus the stupid stuff. So (laughs) so a lot of the ancients believed in gods that were um, also kind of uh, precocious. Had all the, you know, they could, they could, they could, had divine powers. They appeared miraculously, the assured eternal life. They did the things that gods do, but they also did stuff that you would think, I'm not even sure I want my kids to do that, let alone God. <laughs> and, and so along comes Jesus at the end of this line of, of, of beliefs of the ancients, meeting every holy expectation of the ancients minus the nonsense. And, and we wonder why it is that Jesus has an impact on the world the way that no, ancient mythology ever impacted the world. Well, why, why does that happen that way? Well, because he, he meets the mm-hmm. highest expectations of humans when it comes to God and does not possess any of the, the base fallen nature of some of the gods described in mythologies. So, so there's, a, there's definitely a spiritual fuse burning. There's some interesting stuff in that I kind of try to talk about in the book, but it's visual and it's hard to kind of, I mean, there's 400 illustrations in the book for a reason. We're trying to show you where that red zone falls, that little window of opportunity. And the third aspect of this is just the cultural fuse. And that's what you're talking about, Brian, when you're talking about, like, it's one thing to show up. But if you if you if this if if the, if the diamond shows up at the end rolls down the mountain and, and ends up in this stream and it's like wow look at this diamond showed up and then the water just washes it away and buries it in the dirt the next second well it's kind of not going to have any impact on the other hand if there's something there that'll make the diamond travel that's what happens in history it's not just that Jesus shows up at the right time it's that he shows up at a time in which the story of Jesus has the ability to travel the known world. And that's because you're at a place where one empire controlled much of the Mediterranean, the biggest region compared to the Egyptian empire, relatively small, the Persian empire, a little bit bigger, but still relatively small. The Greek empire, bigger than the Persians, but still not as big as the Roman empire, which dominated everything and connected east to west. So you, by the time Jesus shows up, you have a postal service in place. You have the technology of papyrus. You have uh, the Etruscan alphabet, the Greek spoken language. You have roads uh, that are being built because of the 200-year peace called the Pax Romana, in which resources could be diverted to the infrastructure of the Roman Empire. And now suddenly not only do all roads lead to Rome, but roads connect. The, the Silk Road connects from China. These the, every You can get places in a way you could not get places before. As a matter of fact, the roads that Paul traveled, many of which were roads that were part of the infrastructure of the Roman Empire. So now the message of Jesus is timely in the sense that it can be heard in a place, too, of, of you know, the, the thing about Roman Empire is they certainly did not have a high regard for Christians who would not bend their knee to, knee to the Roman gods. And there were, before uh, Christianity became the religion of the empire, there were certainly periods of, of either more or less persecution or tolerance or intolerance. But the standard kind of protocol of the Roman Empire was, hey, whatever gods we you possess and we conquer your nation, you can keep those gods. We might even include some of those gods in our worship services also. But you have have to worship our gods. You have to kind of bend your knee to the gods of the Roman Empire, but you can keep yours. There was a sense of tolerance amongst these groups where uh, captured groups could still uh, express to some degree the, the cultures that they had had all along and the, even the spiritual life they had had all along. And that opens the door to a, a, a worldview like Christianity, at least getting a start before somebody can, before it gets large enough where people are going, well, wait a minute, you, you're not going to bend your knee to the Roman gods? So, so it had a chance to get off the ground in an empire that was large enough 
uh, for the message to travel. And also it was was stable enough so that this thing can get started before another empire crushes the Romans altogether and destroys every belief system within the empire, right, to override it with some other belief system. So there's this window of opportunity that's really based on the history of empires. And and that window was helpful. Also, if you think about it, people have said, and I get a lot of pushback on this, but if he, wouldn't he be more effective if he came today? Well, I, I suppose there's lots of, I mean, God could do whatever God wants to do. And there's some of these questions right. we're asking, we're going to have to wait and ask God when we see him. I mean, some of these, I mean, look, I, we can we can speculate about all kinds of things. But if you think for a second, I have the knowledge of why God would do anything beyond mere human speculation, even if it's a decent inference from evidence, you're crazy, right? Because I know I'm not God and God's going to blow me away with all these answers. Probably most of which he's going to say, Jim, you know, good job, good try, but you were wrong on about 90%. Okay. <laughs> That's probably what God's going to say. But the, my point I'm trying to make here is that, is that, you know, if you think about it, I'm not sure what it would take. At some point you want to be persuasive. And when I say something in this is kind of a human parallel, I, I want to be persuasive when I say something that's important. And I'm trying to figure out like, when should I say it and how should I say it? But when I should say it is important, right? If I, if I wanted to correct my kids, for example, am I going to jump on them right at the point? I might wait a few days so that everything's cooled down. So now in hindsight, I can talk rationally and persuasively about what could have been done in that situation rather than in the heat of the moment, scold them for something they could have done better. So, so I, it's a timing issue a lot of times, even with parenting. And there's a timing issue here too. So, so if you thought, well, if God showed up today, given all the noise, but not just the noise, it's the technology. I mean, mm. we, I, do you trust anything you watch? Right. I mean, honestly, uh, most of the time we don't trust it. And, and, and if you don't want to trust it, if you're desire is not to trust it, you can certainly find a way to blame a technology or to, to distrust the technology or to start writing about that. I think we've gotten to a place where the technology is not even helping us. You can say, well, yeah, but now you have a technology to communicate a truth to the entire world. Yeah, a truth that pretty much no one's going to really trust, especially as divided we, as we are right now. Remember yeah. when Tom Brady was throwing that football in the football thrower, the baseball <laughs> thrower, whatever he was doing, he was throwing it in, then he was hitting the apex every time it was kicking the ball back to him. And we all thought for a day, dude, Tom is really still awesome. <laughs> and then I think the next day they told us, yeah, that was all CGI. Yeah. And we're going, oh, really? Oh, dang. You know, so so you can't believe your eyes anymore, it feels like. Uh, so I just don't know uh, if 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 the argument is, well, no, if there is a God, he would come today mm -hmm. is as persuasive as people think it is. I would agree. Right now we're talking to deep fake Jay Warner Wallace. No, That's right. I don't know if this is real or not. <laughs> I know. I know. Right. And here we are looking at each other on on a video as we're as we're t recording this podcast. And 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 you could you could make that case even. Yeah. So, I mean, this is and that's not look. that's not just me saying that. I mean, that's a yeah. lot of people. How many? OK. You, how many do you believe the miracles we see of televangelists performing on stages across the world today? Right. Uh, no, you don't. You don't. You, you if you'll if, if no matter what happens, you're going to go, come on. You know, that dude was resurrected. That dude, he rose. He, he raised that, that guy out of the casket. You know, you're thinking to yourself, it's like we're so distrusting based on our use of media that I don't even know how, how easy it would be to be persuasive in this generation. Right. No, I yeah. think it's a great point. So we've talked a bit about the, the fuse. Let's talk a bit about the fallout in. Chapter six of the book, it's called Jesus, the Unfounded Fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, you parallel Jesus with Elvis Presley and, and you demonstrate that when you read about Elvis, there are the Presleys, which are family and close friends that liked him. Then there are non-family that liked him. And then there are non-family who we say are strangers who did not like Elvis. And these all wrote about him. Well, in the same way, you argue that Jesus had Christians who wrote about him that liked him, non-Christians who wrote about him that liked him, and then, of course, non-Christians who wrote about him that did not. That's so right. two things from there. First of all, can you talk about the significance of those three groups that wrote about Jesus? And then also, I could easily imagine a skeptic saying something like, well, yeah, see, Elvis, he— he had many. Now, I don't buy this objection, but I could see a skeptic sure. offering it he says, well, you know, Elvis had many fans still today that claim to have seen him. And he continues to have a cultural impact and legends have grown up around his life. Mm -hmm. You know, the same is the same as for Jesus. It's just he's had more time to make an impact, a significant impact because he's 
you know, he's been around longer. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, that's what that would have said the same thing. So, so <laughs> what I'm trying to do with the Elvis uh, comparison is just really talk about how, yeah, their legend does come and, and it does spring. And so if you do research on Elvis books, because I was a teenager when Elvis died and maybe I'm dating myself with the Elvis. People are probably reading this book going, Elvis who? <laughs> Elvis Costello died. I didn't know Elvis Costello died. I, no. I knew who it was. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but, so, but a lot of this is, I just was, I'm fascinated by how much has been written about Elvis and as and it does, there's lots of distortions in these Elvis bios. I mean, there's a mm-hmm. ton. And, and so the question then becomes, and that's a good question. If you put all of the Elvis books in one big pile, there'd be hundreds of them. And then the question would be like, well, which one should I trust? And that's when you start to ask the question, well, who wrote those? And and so you got to ask the question. And also, when do they write them? So if it's written by a family member within, you know, the lifetime of the family member, <laughs> you got a better chance that it's actually probably got something in it. But then you could ask, well, maybe they're painting him in a, in a, in a more um, uh, kind of favorable light, right? Than the non-family member who also likes him. So what I'm looking for is, okay, it turns out that in all those books about Elvis, they're all built and they're all written on a core set of claims. So there's some core truths about the life of Elvis you could find on Wikipedia, for example, right? Mm-hmm. Just like when he was born, where he was born, who his parents were, when he started recording, what his first album was, where he first recorded that, what happened in his career, blah, 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 blah. And then what happens is, is the biographers, they have an angle they want. Look, if it's the biographer that has no new information, who's going to buy the book? So so now you're trying to add stuff to this. And many people rabbit trail off into all different – well, if you just collected all the bios and you read them all and you made a list of all the things they held in common, guess what? I'm pretty sure you're going to find a core set of truths about Elvis that everyone stands on before they start telling the lie. And the same kind of thing happens in the history of literature related to Jesus. You have the, the Christians who liked Jesus, the church fathers. And I try to keep my, my, my focus on that part of history that is in the the first 300 years. I mean, this idea that power can corrupt and then suddenly you have a, 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 a the religion of the empire, which has got leadership issues and blah, 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 and all this corrupt. Okay, fine. So let's just stay before the Antonicene church fathers. Let's just stay, stay in those church fathers that are in that period of time when Christianity is either being tolerated or being persecuted. And it's got the roughest moments for Christianity in the, in the empire. Let's just stay there because more than likely uh, you're going to get some truth claims in there and we'll see if the distortion starts to arise. Look at those three groups, Christians who like Jesus. Those would be the church fathers. Non-Christians who like Jesus. I consider those to be the non-canonical gospel authors because it's clear that if we qualify, what is it to be a Christian? And you have to embrace some creedal set of basic truth claims about Jesus. Well, it's pretty clear that the Gnostics did not uh, hold to those creedal set of truth claims. They had very divergent ideas of what uh, truth was and what um, what would save you, uh, what who, who Jesus was, how Jesus communicated uh, the salvation of, of his followers. All that stuff is very different. So you could call them something. You could call them people who are interested in Jesus, who like Jesus, but you really couldn't call them Christians if by Christians you mean people who believe the things that Christians believe. <laughs> So, so you're not going to be able to call them that. So now they're non-Christians who like Jesus. I consider that's the group that I'm looking at. And then, of course, you have the non-Christians who don't like Jesus at all. And those are all the uh, Romans, Greeks, Egyptians, Persians, Jews in the first three centuries who have something to say on an ancient manuscript somewhere about Jesus or his followers. And by and sometimes by saying something about his followers, they have to make a claim about Jesus himself. So that's great. That gives you some data also. And now, if you look at all the stuff that each one of them says in common, guess what you can do? You can reconstruct the story of Jesus the same way you can reconstruct the story of Elvis. And that's really all I'm trying to say here is that, that yes, are people going to distort? They're going to, you know, someone's going to say, yeah, that, that Jesus was allegedly born of a virgin, but she slept with that Roman guard, Pantera. So so you're going to have to reiterate the claim of the Christians before you try to explain it in your particular way. But all I'm looking at is what are the claims? Because my question is, and this is what kind of like the approach of the book. I mean, it's not as though I haven't written a book about the reliability of Scripture. Okay, that's right. a different book. This right. book is talking about, well, how could you explain the tremendous impact that Jesus has had on literature, the visual arts, music, education, science, and world religions if he's just another dude in the first century? If he's just yeah. another wise rabbi 
You know, there are a lot of rise. The Talmud is full of wise rabbis saying one thing or another that is actually is, is worth memorizing. It's worth it's worth actually reading. But if that's all this guy is, those all those rabbis put together did not have the impact on the world religion on on uh, the world of humans the way that Jesus did. They didn't penetrate into those areas of culture. The stuff that I actually value most, most as an atheist were those areas. Not world religions, but certainly it was, you know, art, music, literature, education, and science. Those are the things that I thought were the, the most important. And it turns out all of those have been deeply impacted by somebody you would expect to have no impact unless, of course, he was who he said he was. Right. This is, and this is the thing that I think is is you have to deal with this with Jesus in some way and, and to deny to use the technology at the end of of, you know, 2000 years of scientific development since the time of Jesus to then complain about Jesus or deny Jesus existence seems to me a bit of an irony. Because it turns out the history of science, for example, what gets us to this moment where we can do this kind of podcast while we're looking at each other from different parts of the planet. Hmm. The ability to do this is dependent upon the worldview established by Jesus and his followers. And if you don't think that's true, you just don't know this history of science. The wow. impact is shocking that Christ and his followers have had on science. Hmm. And, and it could have happened anywhere. Remember, science could have uh, been born and grown in Asia. In Persia, in any other aspect, any other re region of the world in which there was a high population of people at the same time, there was a high population of people in Europe. Yet it didn't. It, it, it arises in one spot at one time in history with one people group the most. I mean, not, not to say that there aren't other people contributing. There are. You know, I'm always impressed. It's a Judeo-Christian tradition. I, it's, I'm always impressed with the number of Jews that Jewish believers who have been involved in the sciences. You know, if you look at the number of Nobel Prize winners in the sciences, the mm -hmm. vast majority are Christians, more than all the other groups put together. But if you look at the second place finishers in that, um, and they're, I think, a much smaller people group, they're Jewish scientists who I think out represent the, you know, they, I think they're almost 30 percent of, of Nobel Prizes are from Jewish scientists. And I don't believe I don't believe the Jewish population on the planet is probably at 30 percent. Yet here they are over performing. And it's all part, and with the Jewish, uh, the Judeo-Christian worldview as a totality together, both Jewish believers and Christians, you're going to find that that group is now at 90% of all uh, Nobel Prizes won in the sciences. So I just think we have to kind of realize that there's something about this worldview. It's not just that, yeah, most people were Christian. It's that there's something that acts as a catalyst. It's not a coincidence. Jesus is a catalyst. And that's why I try to explain in one chapter of the book. And lots of people have tried to explain that. You know, what are the, what is it about the Christian worldview that um, gave it a leg up on other ancient worldviews when it came to uh, examining the natural realm? So now there's a lot of stuff about the Christian worldview that most of us take for granted. We think, well, yeah, that's, that's the proper way to look at the world. Who would look at it differently? Well, well, trust me, when Christianity first came on the scene, there were lots of people groups who looked at it differently. And that's why they didn't do as much science. Yeah, I, I love this idea that it's it's like you're saying that essentially the best explanation of the impact that he's had on science, art, music, literature, world religions is that he was who he said he is. You can deny that, but then you need to come up with a, a an explanation as to how he could have had the impact that he did without being who he claimed he was. Right. And that's a good point, because in every criminal trial, we offer a body of evidence and we ask the jury, which of the two explanations that you've received so far, the one from the prosecution or the one from the defense team actually best explains the evidence, because it's not as though every single defense team is going to offer an alternative explanation. That doesn't happen sometimes. Sometimes mm -hmm. they just say, hey, we don't have an alternative explanation, but we think that they're, we've just successfully knocked down every piece of evidence that they brought up. So they, they're just saying, hey, they don't have a case and we don't need to offer an alternate case because they don't have a case. But sometimes you'll see that the defense team will actually offer uh, alternative explanations for, for, for even individual pieces within the larger case. And then what we're asking a jury to do is to say, okay, look, of these ways, you, you see what the evidence is. And this is what I'm trying to show here. You see what the evidence is. Now the question is, in the last chapter, what is the best way to explain the evidence? So that's why I think that this overwhelming impact that Jesus has had, you have to see it as another form of evidence that must be explained. So we're making a case in this book for the historicity and deity of Jesus. We're just doing it in a way that I don't think the other 
necessarily people have done yet or have kind of maybe done it this way particularly. Um, mm-hmm. And this is not to say, again, there are so many much in the, my books behind me on the shelves here are filled with books of people who are way smarter who I'm reading who before and I and I don't pretend to be uh, an historian. I don't pretend to be a manuscript evidence, uh, a manuscript, uh, manuscript expert. Um, I don't, I, you know, I have a degree in theology, a master's in theology, but I, I don't pretend to hold an academic degree that uh, I'm vetting all of this through. I'm just like you guys, all of us who are listening, who are members of a jury. And so I've just trained myself to look in weird places for stuff that I think everything counts as evidence. So therefore I'm looking at everything and then I'm going to show it to all everybody else And you can make up your own mind. But in the end, I think all of us have a duty to explain how Jesus could have this kind of impact on every important aspect of culture, including religious belief, because pretty much every belief system, theistic system on the planet right now will in some way acknowledge for some reason the person of Jesus. If Mm -hmm. if, if If he's not in their scripture... They talk about him like he's somebody who they could they could get behind. They like his teaching. The religious leaders in Buddhism, the religious leaders in Hinduism, they have embraced Jesus. They've talked about Jesus. So if you're listening to your leaders, if you're listening to the leaders of religious movements, or if you're reading your own scripture, you may have a, a, a statement about Jesus in there. Yet Jesus does not return the favor. Jesus does not make room for Buddhism and Hinduism and Zoroastrianism or or, or Krishna or Indra or any of the other uh, gods who preceded Jesus in the minds of, of mythologists. Instead, he says, no, I'm, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one mm-hmm. is going to come to the Father except through me. And that exclusivity has always been a complaint, right, against right. Jesus. But the reality of it is, is that it separates him from other groups who are willing to. And look, if you're a Baha'i, pretty much everyone's prophet is your prophet. Everyone's a manifestation of God. Buddha, Muhammad, Jesus, Baha'u'llah, they're all, everyone's in the game. But if you're a Christian, there's no one else in the game. It's just Jesus. And not only that, everyone else is saying, hey, you got to do these five or six things. 10 things, 12 things before you have a chance to be united to your father Mm -hmm. or to progress to the next life or to extend to to celestial kingdom or to nirvana, whatever it is. Right. And Jesus alone says, no, guys, there's nothing you can do. You guys are too lame to do anything significant. Okay, so it turns out you're going to need to trust me on this because it's the only way you're going to get there. Well, that view is so unique amongst religious worldviews. Look, when you work a case where there's like, I've had cases where I've had like eight potential suspects for this woman's murder. And wow. and in the end, one's going to stand out. You can do all this work. You kind of raise the investigation on all eight years later. And then one ends up, you know, he's unique. Got a unique relationship with her, a unique set of circumstances, a unique skill set that matches the crime scene, a unique opportunity and a schedule to do this. There's some things about him that are different than the others. And as this one guy stands out uniquely, you start to become your person of interest. Well, the same thing's happening here from a kind of a theological perspective. He's so unique compared to the others that at some point he becomes the person of interest, especially when everyone wants to hat tip him and borrow something from him, yet he is not there looking to borrow from anybody else. So I Mm. think that's one of those things you've got to consider is unique about Jesus. How do you explain that, you know? That's great. Yeah, this has been a great summary of the book. You know, it gives I think it's given a great overview for people, hopefully whet their appetite. So I have a question I've always wanted to ask you. All right. And why am I going to be sorry you're going to ask this? You know, there's always a point at which you think this podcast went five minutes too long. So here we are. We're at that point right now. Go. Yeah, I saw a Q&A with Mark Middleberg once and, and uh, they were like, uh, we have time for one more question. And he was like, oh, it's always this question. <laughs> I know, right? Right. You don't you know what it is, but the last question is going to be something like that. So go ahead. Right. So one of the kind of objections that I've seen leveled towards your work, and it's not mm-hmm. specifically toward the case you're making here in person of interest, and, and mm-hmm. it'll make sense as I explain it, but it goes something like this. You know, you're attempting in, in your career in, in to solve cold cases, right? And you're always operating under the assumption I've heard. I'm sure you've heard this before operating under the assumption that the cause, you know, or the killer is a human being. Mm -hmm. But when you're investigating something like the existence of God, say, like in God's crime scene, Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. um, or the resurrection, you open the door to the cause being, you know, supernatural. Mm-hmm. So kind of the objection I've heard is, as well, you know, when he's when he's doing his cold cases, he's never uh, looking for a supernatural cause. But then when he applies his cold case skills to some of these other questions, then he opens the door to that. So there's like an inconsistency, they claim. So does right, that, right. yeah. So how would Not you, before. sure. That, I mean, when's the last time you defaulted to ghosts in a, uh, in a murder scene yes. or to, you know, well, look, it, it's what it comes down to. I mean, you follow the evidence where it goes. It's as simple as that, guys. It's not like mm. rockets, you know, like rocket surgery to mix two metaphors. Okay, this is this is just <laughs> this is just a matter of following evidence where it goes. So if I'm in a crime scene and the evidence points to the human involvement of a murderer, I'm going to stay looking for the human involvement of a murderer. If it points to a suicide, if it points to then an unknown, I'm not sure there's a murderer here. Maybe it's natural. I'm not sure. You follow the evidence where it goes. You know, I have not yet worked a case. Where the evidence seems strong that I had something supernatural occurring. Mm. I just haven't had that kind of a case. So, yeah, the question really is, well, would you be willing to consider it if you did have? Well, what would you do if you ended up with a case where everyone you talk to says, yeah, I shot him five times. I blew his head off and then I saw him reach over, put his head back on and and uh, walk off. I mean, what what do you do with that? If that was what your testimony, you're, you're going to think, well, something bizarre is happening here. And I mean, I got I got people talking about it. I got people who have witnessed this and said it. And then guess what? Then I, I, I found half his brain on the ground. But then later on, I got a sighting over here across town and his fingerprints are on that counter. Now I've got to think about, look, this is bizarre, right? There's no way this guy should be. So now I got to consider something supernatural, right? Mm-hmm. Like, look, this make a good story. But but I I don't have cases like that. Am, am I opposed to uh, – clearly, if, you, if you're saying Jim Wallace is opposed to following the evidence where it leads, well, then you don't know me. But right. I, I can tell you that in the cases I have worked, the, the evidence always points to a human suspect. And so I'm working human suspects. This does not mean, though, I'm opposed – to I think it'd be kind of cool if a case did pop up where there's no way to explain this by human uh, interaction, right? Where I could, I mean, I'm going to write a book about that immediately if it ever happens. Okay, <laughs> but for now, I'm kind of stuck with these cases I have, and and so now if you're ever saying though that that you could not use these set of principles in an investigation to identify a non-natural or just a, a, a supra or extra natural cause, I don't think that's actually true. Because what we're looking for, right? I mean, really what we're looking for is, 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 is agency. When we look at a case, we're asking the question, is this an event causation kind of case or is this a, a free uh, agent causation kind of a case? So we're looking for agent causation. That's what we're looking for in these cases. So, for example, if I get there and he's lying on the ground and he's dead and I don't know what his injuries are yet, but I can see on the wall there's blood spatter. Well, I could say to myself, okay, he might have just fallen a certain way, and that would cause the blood spatter, given the physics of, of spatter and the chemistry of blood and how it drips. I might be able to explain all of that. There's actually no murderer. This is an accidental. Maybe this is a – but now if I – you know, it's a suicide maybe. But but now if I get there and on the wall, instead of blood spatter that can be explained by space, time, matter, physics, and chemistry, I find that it's written in his blood, you deserved it. Well, now I'm shifting my investigation, right? Because I am now Mm. moving away from what appears to be either the event causation of an accidental, and if he's dead, he can't write anything, to somebody who's written you, not I deserved it. No, you deserved it in his blood. I realize that the evidence there for agent causation is too strong for me to ignore it. Mm. So that same approach, for example, could be used to look for agent causation anywhere, including in DNA including in other aspects of design where you cannot explain it from space, time, matter, physics, and chemistry. You have to move toward agent causation. And I think that's what we're trying to do in crime scenes often, because we're not sure that it's a crime scene. It might just be a death scene. And we're trying to figure out which is it. Well, this approach will help you. Uh, Same thing, but this is all we're trying to do here too. So again, if I cannot point to a human agent as the cause of a crime, well, then I have to start looking in different directions. But I just haven't had a case where that's been the been the been the challenge. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. But but again, you know, I and I, I get the, the the objections though. You know, look in the, I, I try to answer objections as they come up. But what I've learned is at some point now, uh, doing this for just now what about eight years since I retired, 
Um, you just, you have to kind of realize that, that there's some people I'm not going to convince and I'm okay with that. I, my job is not to convince you. My job is to make the case. Right. And it might be convincing. And for yeah. some people it won't, and it won't always be based on the evidence in the case or even the way I present it. It may just be based on, on other issues that are beyond my control. Yeah. And I have never found that objection toward your work persuasive myself. And I've always just looked at it similar to what you said of like, well, I don't think he's saying that he's not open to that. I think he's just saying that, for example, when I look at everything in the room, if we're right. going back to crimes, God's crime scene, it points to something beyond the universe or outside of the room. So that's where the evidence leads. It's that's just right. in the in the cases, the evidence doesn't leave there. So, yeah, that's right. And so here's the other thing, too, Chad, and you know this because you've probably read as much apologetics, you and Brian together as anybody <laughs> on the planet. OK, so <laughs> so between the two of you, you've read so much material. Yeah, I kind of feel like what we have to do is is, is understand that if you had talked to me the year before I got saved, you, there's no way you would have guessed I would ever be saved. So, mm-hmm. so there's a patience that I have with, with folks that is, and I, I, you can kind of say, well, how, our job is limited, right? I, I do, I do believe that God does the heavy lifting here. And, but what I'm trying to do is just, just clear some of the shrubs, clear some of the, try to help down, knock down the walls that we all build around ourselves to present ourselves from, uh, from hearing the gospel. I had uh, issues in front of me that I was never consider uh, the gospel seriously. And so I, all I can do is, is knock some of those down for people or help knock some of those down for people, or help them walk through those so they can actually, at some point when they hear the gospel, they're less, they haven't built up all these, these other issues that they have to have, you know, be dealt with. So a lot of that is just me trying to, to make the case as as persuasively as I can, and but at the same time, not worry about the the the, um, the conclusion. Now, what I've discovered is Christians a lot of times will look at the smallest thing that I might say as affirmation of their view without digging any deeper. And the same thing is true on the other side, where if I can just knock down Jim by saying, "Well, yeah, but he doesn't do this," and, this. and for a lot of people who don't want to hear what I say anyway, that's enough. Okay, good. I can disregard now. You're, you're mm-hmm. telling me, give me permission as somebody I trust in the atheist uh, world to disregard the uh, work of Jim Wallace. The same way that sometimes on the Christian side, we say, oh, good. So you've knocked down this objection. So now you've given me permission uh, from our side to disregard everything that Richard Dawkins says. Well, Mm -hmm. it's not quite as easy as that in either direction, right? The truth is always much more complex. And that's why I think in the end, it's always going to be about a cumulative case. And that's why I take that approach. Because it's it's easy to knock down one thing with a trite statement, whether it's true or not, but it sounds persuasive. I can knock. But if the evidence is built not only on the, all the different aspects we talk about in, in, in cold case Christianity for the reliability of the New Testament, but on all the aspects of culture we're talking about in person of interest, it's much harder to kind of ignore all that, right? It's, I mean, you can get a knock down. You, you're, you're forcing me to look at the tree and ignore the forest, hmm. right? There's a ton of stuff here. Don't get caught up in the minutia. Remember, all these things have to be explained as a totality of the of the evidence. Mm. The, the entire puzzle, every piece comes together to make a puzzle that I think clearly demonstrates the existence of God. And you might say, well, I'm just going to take out one piece at a time. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't change the fact that a puzzle can be built from lots of different aspects of culture and history and reality that demonstrates that God exists and the Christian God of the Bible is that God. So I think a part of that's why I stay in a cumulative case. I don't think there's any one thing that should convince anybody. I think it's the totality of the evidence that should be overwhelming. Well, that's really helpful. Thanks for that, Jim. Now, I know your book is out now, and but there's also some other resources maybe that go along with that. Could you talk just briefly about that and where people might be able to find those additional resources for the book, what those are? Oh, that's great. I'm glad you're asking. I I never heard you talk about those um, in podcasts, but the book you can find at personofinterestbook.com. We have some pre-order stuff, but I'm getting ready also to release another um, offer probably in next month just to kind of give people teaching resources they can use if they want to teach the book to others. And so that's at personofinterestbook.com. Um, but if you if you order the book now, all, all that stuff will be available to you as well uh, when it all comes out. So my hope is that we'll have those teaching resources up soon. But in the meantime, too, we, we have small group study. So we, we built an investigator's guide for the book, and it's very heavily illustrated. I think it reads pretty fast. It, it's pretty interactive, and it's meant to be used with a video series. It's two and a half hours of a kind of a drama <laughs> It's like a, it's kind of like a, like an investigative cop drama slash curriculum for Jesus. And it's, uh, right now it's at, at, available at Igniter TV. 
They're the ones who produced it. They have a new streaming platform. And this platform is uh, got chosen, uh, are streaming chosen on it. They're streaming a yeah. bunch of other stuff. And they're also streaming Person of Interest. It's a 10-episode miniseries. And that 10-episode miniseries is also available on Right Now Media. If you've got that through your church, just uh, just search for Jay Warner Wallace and you'll see it's the first queued. Um, uh, I think I've got like seven or eight studies there, but it's the first one in the queue. And so you can watch it. And I think you'll find it engaging, even if you don't read the book. But really, if you read the book or if you have the, the study guide, I think it'll really um, help you to, I mean, the study guides are not always just the book. The study guide is a lot about devotional scripture, uh, additional studies you can do on, during the middle of the week. It's really designed to be done over 10 weeks and just kind of help you to, to, to grow in your confidence. And you can find that stuff at Right Now Media or at Igniter TV. And eventually next month, it'll come out as a DVD set. That just takes time to kind of create. So the digital stuff always comes out first. So that's available right now. It actually uh, published two days ago. So that's just pretty new stuff. And then the book, of course, is at personofinterestbook.com. Super. Well, Jim, thank you so much for joining us. And we wish you all the best with this book and uh, hope that it continues to do well. We're looking forward to see what you're going to come up with next. I, I know you're just like yes. churning out the material. Well, I have one also. more book, I think, that I, I need to write. After that, I'm not quite sure, but I have one more that I want to write. And that's that's I start that next January. So, all right. Yes, that's the life of of writing uh, books. It's pretty. It's actually fun though, guys, and I appreciate um, all the work that you're doing. It turns out that the books are just one aspect of making the case, and so much more right now is being done probably digitally online. So the work you're doing is super important. It has been. You're like one of the first resources, Brian, that I ever read as a coming out of retirement as a detective and kind of entering into this world of apologetics. So I just want to just just encourage you. Don't don't get tired. You've done it a long time, uh, and I think the best days are for your ministry are still ahead of you. So thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks. Great to see you. Good to see you too, guys. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you have a question you'd like us to address or just a message for us, feedback, good or bad, you can either email us at podcast at apologetics315.com or leave a voice message for us using SpeakPipe. Just go to speakpipe.com slash apologetics315 to leave us a message. And remember, if you include a Ghostbusters quote in your question, we guarantee that we'll read it on the podcast. And we also ensure up to 50% better quality answers. Also, if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave a review in iTunes or the podcast platform of your choice, and please share this episode with a friend if you found it useful. Remember, you can find lots of apologetics resources at apologetics315.com, along with show notes for today's episode. Find Chad's apologetics stuff over at Truth Bomb Apologetics. That's truthbomb.blogspot.com. This has been Brian Auten and Chad Gross for the Apologetics 315 podcast, and thanks for listening. This episode is brought to you by Southern Company. Southern Company is making energy smart and sustainable for their 9 million customers across the country. Southern Company, building the future of energy. Learn more at southerncompany.com slash future. The General Insurance presents Ordering a Sandwich with Shaq and Hall of Fame announcer Michael Buffer. I'm going to have roast beef. What do you want, Michael? Let's get ready for pastrami on rye. Turns out, Michael Buffer talks like that all the time. And it turns out, The General is a quality insurance company that's been saving people money for nearly 60 years. Spicy Dijon Mustard. For a great low rate and nearly 60 years of quality coverage, make the right call and go with The General. Some restrictions apply.